Hello, everyone. Thank you for being patient with us. And welcome to The Artist's Voice, Kevin Beasley in conversation with Lumi Tan. My name is Nico Whedon, and I'm the Public Programs Manager here at the Studio Museum. And we're very excited to announce a new format for the Artist in Residence Public Programs. Um, so now instead of one panel featuring all three artists, each resident artist will be given their own program in which to kind of more deeply explore aspects of their practice that maybe weren't highlighted through the exhibition itself. Um, so yeah, if you didn't find time today to go and see Kevin's works on view, the exhibition will be up until the end of October. So I will pass the microphone to Adize. Good evening. So I'm just going to introduce Kevin and Lumi for you guys. Um, Kevin Beasley's work creates sculptural and sound-based works that explore notions of physical presence and spaces of sound and memory. And he is joined by his critical dialogue partner, Lumi Tan, who is associate curator at The Kitchen and associate editor of the Exhibitionist Journal on Exhibition. So we're really excited about this conversation and hope that you guys are ready to dialogue with us afterwards. everyone, thanks for coming tonight, and thanks to the Stu Museum and to Kevin for inviting me to dialogue. <laughs> um, as I did mentioned, I've been um, Kevin's partner, critical dialogues partner during his residency here, um, which has been a real pleasure. And I think the intention of the um, talk tonight is to kind of bring our you know, the intimate conversations we've been having in the studio to a public audience. So um, Kevin rearranged the theater tonight, so um, everyone would feel a little bit more comfortable speaking up whenever you feel like it, if you have a question. Um, we um, have unofficially renamed this the artist's voice, Lumi's voice, and everyone else's voice, so we'd love to hear from you. And um, I think we're gonna start off with, with Kevin doing a non-performance. Right. Do that. Uh, thanks for being here. <clears throat> um, does anybody want to sit here? Yeah. No? I'm, I'm just, just offering it before we get, because it's, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. He's here anyway. Um, so, so right. So um, obviously uh, in the show, there aren't any audio works or anything. Um, of this nature happening, and it's a major part of how I uh, think and work in the studio, and then also share maybe my, my thoughts and my feelings and experiences. Um, my art practice has kind of uh, evolved into this more nebulous way of working, uh, and things are kind of folding into each other in terms of working more physically with material. Um, and then uh, taking some of that same approach um, and applying it to audio. And so I'm, I'm going to kind of, this is kind of an experiment in terms of what I'm playing or what I'm, what I'm doing. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about uh, recontextualizing um, certain sounds, sound bites, where they come from. And, uh, and hopefully in some way it's an extension on things that I'm thinking about and can spark a more in-depth conversation. And in, and in addition to that, uh, maybe, bridge, maybe, bridge, maybe bridge what's happening um, in the galleries. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this.
work to do. I'm in a bathroom in a shower. You're not gonna do what do you do?
started screaming. I meet my McDonald's. I uh, come outside. I see this girl going nuts, trying to get out of the house. So I go on the porch. I go on the porch, and she says, "Help me get out. I've been, I'm, I've been in here a long time." So you know, I figured it's a, a domestic violence dispute. So I open the door. We can't get in that way, but how the door is, it's so much that a body can't fit through, only your hand. So we can kick the bottom, and she comes out with a little girl, and she says, call 911. My name is Amanda Berry. And did you know who that was when, you, when she said that? When she told me, it didn't register until I got to call 911. And I'm like, I'm calling the 911 for Amanda Berry. I thought this girl was dead. You know what I mean? And, and she got on the phone, and she said, yes, yeah, this is me. And the detective, uh, Cook, right here. Detective Gregory Cook says, Charles, do you know who you arrested? I said, I said, when did you see it? When did you see Gina? About, 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 about. So about five minutes after the police got here. See, that girl Amanda told the police, I ain't just the only one. It's some old girls up in that house. So they went up there, you know, 30, 40 deep, and when they came out, it was just astonishing, because I thought we would come up with nothing. I figured, I mean, whoever she was, and like I said, my neighbor, I mean, you, got, you got some big testicles to pull this off, bro, because we see this dude every day. I mean, every day. I'm I'm here. Here. I've been here a year. Okay. You should come around. Right. I barbecue with, with this dude. We eat ribs and then whatnot. This is soft music. You should come around. You have no indication that they're really that girl was in that house or anybody else in there against their will because how he is is I, he just comes out to his backyard plays with the dogs taking with his cars and motorcycles goes back in the house so he's somebody that you look and you look away because he's not doing nothing but the average stuff you see what I'm saying nothing exciting about him well until today <laughs> what was your reaction on the girl's faces I can't imagine to see the sunlight to be real I knew something was wrong when a little pretty white girl ran into a black man's arm Something's wrong here. Dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. Charles Secretary. Dead giveaway. Give away. Thank you very much for your time. Either she homeless or she had problems. That's the only reason why she runs to a black man. Charles Secretary. Thank you for being there, man. Charles Ramsey, neighbor, heard the screaming, took action, went and did what he needed to do. The rest is unfolding before us here on Seymour. We're going to send it back to you.
Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> so um, we've talked a lot about how you recontextualize materials both in your sound works and in your sculptures. And I think you play a lot with um, things that are instantly familiar to kind of, you know, wider audience and then things that kind of need a certain type of, um, you know, a closer knowledge or a specific knowledge. and. Um, your, in your sculptures, you know, you name certain materials that are used and, and they're kind of general descriptives, but um, could you talk about more specifically how they relate to you personally and um, why you choose not to reveal that in, in like a wall label or right. um, when you're generally talking about the work? Right. Yeah. Um, so, so I feel like everything has some type of, uh, well, not just a story, but it ha it's, has this, like, l this life or this lived experience that um, in some way, if I can trace that material or if I think about something. So for instance, um, like the pillowcase, there's a pillowcase piece that's like on the wall. And that, that was like just like one of my pillowcases that got a big hole in it. And I was like, well, I, this is gonna come to the studio. And usually that's what happens with a lot of the materials is that they, uh, if they're, they're traceable in some way uh, or have some, maybe some interest or maybe it's something that I question or it has some direct link or um, personal experience, then I'm compelled more so now than I used to be and, 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 and increasingly to kind of investigate that uh, in the studio and find maybe hopefully when it's shared, it. Uh, it, there's some recognition of uh, maybe some commonality, something that people can relate to or they, that they can think about on their own terms. 
Um, but so to speak closer to that, uh, one of the works, which is like a mumu, like a red, like nightgown piece. This was last summer, right before the, the this residency had started. Um, my I have a lot of family that grew up on my mom's side. They grew up in Harlem, and when they were visiting, when my aunt Diane, who lives in Baltimore now, her and my mom came to New York, and they do this thing. They hang out, and uh, they. <laughs> They, I mean, it's like old times. It's like they're like walking the streets of Harlem again, like they were kids, and they're just like, "Oh yeah, let's shop." Like my mom was going to buy, a, she wanted to buy a cell phone case, and they told her uh, they were like, it was like three dollars, and she was like, "What?" She's like, "I'm not paying three dollars. Like I got my phone for a dollar. Like I'm not gonna pay three dollars for a case. I got my phone for a dollar." So they were. I, I got to like sort of walk around with them, and we would visit New York pretty often. And my grandmother on their side, and my great-grandmother, who I was lucky enough to actually meet, um, they, lived on, they lived in projects on, I think it's 116th and um, Madison. It's either Madison or Park. And on the corner, we were walking, and my aunt was like, uh, my, and my mom, they were like, oh, yeah, that's the, that's the shop that, that your grandma used to get her nightgowns. Oh yeah, we used to get that. That shop's been there forever. They're still there. Oh, da, 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 da. I was like, whoa. They used to go to that place and get them, uh, and it's still there. And I remember him. It was so distinct. We'd walk into because my my grandmother lived, or my aunt uh, lives in uh, the projects on Lenox and One Fourteenth. I think it is the Martin Luther King projects, and. Uh, so this neighborhood's really familiar, but I was like, well, I'm gonna, I, I wanna check that out. Like, I wanna go over there and just, you know, I don't know, there's some thing about, you know, your, your family or their, their experiences and where they're walking. And so I went into this, this shop after I came here for the residency and uh, I walked in and the guy, he like looked at me and I just like, all right, I'm gonna go shopping. And so I'm like looking through all these nightgowns and I'm trying to like pick out ones that reminded me of what she would wear and then ones that were just kind of interesting, maybe the, the form or the pattern. And he looked at me and he said, you need help with something? I was like, no, I'm good. I know, I know what I'm, and he's like, you're gonna, you're gonna get that one? I was like, well, this will be one. He's like, I'll put them on the counter. I was like, okay. He's like, you do know this is a three X, right? I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, I know, it's a 3X. And so I kept shopping, and I was looking for other ones, and I ended up buying like six or seven of them. And, and he was like, I, you know, he was like, just out of curiosity, just, what, are you, what are you, are these a gift or something? And I, and I, I told him, I said, well, I didn't want to like use the artist thing, but, or say that that was the excuse of well, there, there might be a gift. I, you know, I don't know yet. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was like, all right. He's like, well, you know, whatever you do with them, you should, you should you know, yeah, you should give them to someone because they're really nice. And, and I talked to him, and he was like, well, I asked him, I said, well, how long have you been open? He said, been open for over 50 years in the same location. And I was just like, wow, that's crazy thinking about the way that the, the neighborhood is changing a lot, and to even be able to go into an establishment that my great grandmother went to, same exact one, and it's a family owned business. So to think about bridging that sort of connection and thinking about that, uh, or maybe just even just just that as a question, like well, what is what is that? What is that in material? That that material that I'm walking out of now, what does that generate? And then what am I actually trying to tap into? And I, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. It's why it's the work is existing in the way that it is. And I think everything that I'm sort of doing, like the, the the rug piece, was one that just lived in my studio for, for the time that I was here. And as people sort of walked in, they would trample on it and walk around through it. And I think, in some way, how the material sort of gathers and collects a history, is uh, is 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 important and. To at least then say, well, then, how do I generate meaning, or is this meaningful? And to ask questions around it. Um, yeah. 
And the way you work with these materials, you kind of are petrifying it in a present moment after it's kind of lived its life. Right. Um, and maybe you can talk about like the physical process of, um, I think Lauren mentions in her introduction to the brochure to the exhibition upstairs that you know it's an indexical mark of how you physically handled it. Right. Yeah, yeah, they they're, um, yeah, they're really they are really physical in that way. I'm, I'm usually like wrestling something, or it's kind of messy. So like I use a lot of two part something. So like the foam or resin that I'm using, I have to mix it in certain batches. And from there, I, um, I I don't really make any complex molds. I kind of consider all of the material that I'm using or what the object is itself as a mold or if I grab like a plastic bin. But usually I'm, I'm taking it and I'm pouring it into something else or I'm, uh, or I'm, just, or I'm just pouring it on the, on the ground with, uh, with like a, with a drop cloth down and then gathering it up so that the marks that I'm making, the things that I, and then I have to like hold it and it sits for, it sets really fast. A lot of the stuff that I use sets in like maybe 10 minutes uh, at most, has a pot life of like two minutes. So it, it'll harden and then it cures in like 10 minutes and it's ready to be, uh, I don't know, for me to do something else to it. And so a lot of times they, they are like these extremities, or there was a work that I did in, in four, actually, that was one of the large, at the time, it was the largest work that I had made out of this material. And I had to do it in two parts. And I remember being in the studio just kind of laying on the ground like this for like 10, 10 20 minutes, just trying to like hold it in a specific form. And when you see it, you see the work, it kind of embody. it looks like a, a, a big, sack that is kind of like a body um, and in some way those marks are are there from that physical but I think it comes out of out of the the necessity or the handling of the material the more that I understand how it operates and what I can do with it um, then I, I get looser with the sort of forms that I'm trying to pour into or or make I, I would I wish they could just float and then I could <laughs> then I could really like interact with them in that way, but yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> I, think, I think it's clear that um, a lot of your sculptures have this anthropomorphic quality, even though they're made of these synthetic materials. And I wanted to ask about the towel piece upstairs, because um, in the brochure it's photographed in your studio kind of leaning against a wall right, right. and then it ended up being exhibited as lying flat on the floor and becomes a completely different piece and really you know looking back at these images after what happened with Mike Brown and Ferguson it really took on this like very weighty you know symbolism of like a surrender or just this kind of discarded body mm -hmm. yeah I've, I've been I've been thinking about, I had a conversation with Lauren actually in the studio about, about that a little bit uh, in, in sort of thinking about the flatness of something or thinking about how you, uh, you know, like a t-shirt kind of just like laying across, a, a, I don't know, taking the form of a chair or just laying on the floor, um, how far it, how much that references the body or someone's maybe it's like it's it's someone's character or maybe it's just it's uh it uh i don't know it's always in context with a body or a person and I, i'm trying to think about well how far how far can you get from that how flat can something be where it's very empty and then maybe then the specifics of whatever that material is starts filling that that void or filling that um maybe that 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 just I don't know what the word what the word would be, but that's I feel like that's something that I'm I'm curious about right now, um, is you know like the chalk line or something, or something, uh, but then it, if it if it's in like a position that isn't so so much of a of a caricature and actually uh, actually mimics the sort of the bulbousness of our bodies and the the varying differences of our bodies then. 
they become more amoebic in that way, or they, they, they seem more fluid. And I think that the arrangement or thinking about something that was leaning is now on the floor, and then it can be on the wall, and then it can kind of exist in all of these places. The kind of silhouette of what that does, I think, holds some weight or can, even if it is very, you know, it's like this then. It's, it's like a, it's a gesture of, of crystallizing that material. Um, and yeah, maybe that's, it's like this, this audio, the first, uh, the first segment from the, the, Mike, the Michael Brown, was like the aftermath, like that's like, that video or that tape was the one that was right after it happened. And pulling back from sort of the video and just thinking, and just listening to the audio, um, you kind of you flatten the dimensionality of that, or what it like. I don't know your experience, what you can experience when you're, you know, you have visual audio, visual. You kind of take away some of that, but then you're 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 filling in those images. You're still trying to create a more holistic experience, um, and, and I think in some way the 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 way it can be recontextualized or positioned or its arrangement can trigger that. Uh, you know, like us, it, it, it can trigger us putting something in, or, or, or uh, requiring that, or you feel like, oh wow, I'm gonna think about something, you know, maybe more, something else that's related, that maybe more personal, or however you approach it. But yeah. Yeah, I think this this idea of always leaving room for the audience to to bring themselves to the work or bring their own meaning to the work has been is really important. In, in both your sound work and your sculpture. Yeah, I think it's in, it's in, it's like a half it's like halfway you know or like you know the there was a work that I recently did at uh, at Casey Kaplan that was a tape tape reel. It really was about that experience of people, you know, like you you just have to be there in the physical space to hear the work and that moment that you hear it you, you're not going to get another moment to hear that sort of portion of of that arrangement so it's it's kind of like you know that's why that's why it's shared i mean these are the questions i'm asking i i hope are not only just mine i mean they they they're channeled through me but i feel like uh in some way there's a meeting point yeah yeah, it's interesting because I think you're often cited as a site-specific artist or a site, I think I saw sensitive artist, which I really liked. <laughs> but there's never any reference to like a site-specific viewer, you know, when obviously we all bring our own experience and, and knowledge to, to seeing or experiencing art. Right. Um, but maybe you could explain like the... Uh, the t uh, sorry, the kind of like setup of the piece of Casey Kaplan in terms of oh, right. like the work week and right that was right, really right, right. to the it's, piece. Yeah, so the the work was actually uh, it was made up of all like cassette tape. It was a it was a, a reel to reel player, and uh, the reel to reel player only plays quarter inch tape. And there, when I was uh, approached to, to and or invited rather to do the, to be in the show, I um, I was like, what am I like? What kind of sound work am I going to do for two months? Like, what what kind of audio would exist for that length of time that one wouldn't be redundant and continue and loop over and over and over and drive people crazy? I mean, how do you how do you actually like think about the 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 context that it's going to be in, and then the fact that it's it's sort of physicality? How do I like really, I don't know, play to that and still address this duration of of two, of like two months, which I think is a long time to be listening to one sound. Uh, so I was like, okay, well then I should really just focus on what kind of experience could where you walk in and whatever you're sort of hearing is something very specific to that moment. 
And I think all of the other decisions about using tape became more apparent because it was, it was so much about that physical moment. So the work was consists of uh, 52 reels, and each reel has 40 hours of cassette tape that's all spliced together. And the cassette tapes come from uh, every, they come from everywhere. Like Casey gave me some that he had when he was younger, that like ex-girlfriends gave him, and like I got a bunch from my mom. She works at a public library, and she had just loads and loads of audio books. So I had like Shakespeare and like Toni Morrison and all of this like really crazy stuff. And then I got the bulk of them from a record store in Queens that they had the widest range just ra like radio recordings. There were these will tapes. I didn't get to listen to all of them, but there were these will tapes where there was literally people reading their wills. I think it was like a lawyer or some like firm that had them. And, uh, and so they were all just mixed and sort of spliced together. And when you walked into the gallery, whatever it was that you were listening to was specific to that moment. Because once the reel completes, then it goes back with the other 52. And each reel is corresponds to the week of a year. So maybe if you were, if the work was up the next year and you came at the same hour at the same time, you'd be able to hear it. But the chances of that are very unlikely. So, um, so it was really like I couldn't get away from a loop because we're, our, you know, there's these cycles that we're living in. And so you can't completely get away from that. Um, but in some way, it was about extending our, our, our perception of that or, or what we can possibly experience. And maybe if it's a little bit outside of our life humanness or physicalness, then it maybe it, it then reiterates the physical experience of it. Um, and that's also very generous to the gallery staff for us to come and listen to it every day. Yeah, yeah well, it was. I mean, it, it was, you know, it's not a 24-7 work, so it, it's only happening when the gallery, when the people from the gallery come in and they turn it on and then they turn it off. And that that's really the that's like the work it, it relies on people so i think that in some way it, I've, like it has to be considerate of those that are actually i don't know I, there's this thing about just being like it having some consideration for that context and in, and in some way that can uh, actually open up the possibility of the experience and that it's not like a limiting thing it's just a it's a it's a pro it's a problem and that problem can be uh addressed Maybe I'll do like a really annoying like five <laughs> second loop for a year or something, but I think it, if I do, it'll be it'll be appropriate for whatever that context is. <laughs> I think, well, that also speaks to this idea that we also talk about a lot. Um, you know how you you can't ever like the the idea of getting your work or really anyone's work in its entirety is impossible so it's like that was like a really literal kind of translation of this idea. you'll never hear every single tape or right. every sound and doesn't necessarily matter because <laughs> you know it's it's the concept and it's um it's not the individual pieces that make it up right right and my, and i haven't it's like for me it's the first sound work that i've never heard i haven't fully heard it right and i don't i would never will so there were moments where I would just go in the gallery and I would sit in the gallery and just like listen to it. And that's, I mean, it's great because it's, you know, of course you, you physically spliced all those tapes together, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it kind of freed you up a little bit from, from controlling the sound in the way that you do in performances. Right, right, right. Yeah, it did actually. It was kind of, I didn't feel, although it was a more involved work, I didn't feel completely over it when I finished. When I finished it, I was actually kind of ex like, "Okay, wow, now I can kind of experience what this thing is." And uh, I think if you're if you if you're making work a lot, you kind of have that experience where you're just like, "All right, you're working on something," and you're like, "Okay, I, I need like a break from it." And that work didn't it didn't quite feel that way. It felt like I, now I have this other this other time or this other moment to experience it and then to really think about it. And the other aspect of it that I didn't, 
that I didn't talk about was that it uh, for that exhibition and that, that that's a, a part of the work is that it's it's supposed to be programmed uh, their performances so I, I organized a few performances that would coincide with the work and what happens is, is those performances get recorded onto the tape and so it erases what was previously there and then you have you know because tape really cassette tape no one's using cassette I mean I don't know how many people in here are using cassette tape um, but it's a really it's a it's it's still prominent you can still find it there are a lot of like tape labels and there's a massive subculture that's really invested in cassette tape. But uh, on, on like a general, I mean, you know, you go to, you go to a store and you get tapes, it's kind of, the cashier looks at you like, what, like, are you, like, what are you doing? Why are you buying these, these tapes? And, um, but really the industry stopped putting out tapes in like, I don't know, maybe like, like 2000 or something or around that time. They stopped putting records out or new music out on on cassette tape, and so I was in like wow like when I was going through all of this stuff I was like there is a really it's a period piece there's a very specific time that the work uh, deals with and how do I how do I uh, navigate that or or in some way um, maybe I, I add some liveness to it or consider what that is liveness and for it to be recorded or archived or how, whatever you want to call it onto this thing and that it erases something so there's a there's kind of a there's a there's a currency that's that's happening that you're like okay there's this piece is there it's really about this moment but it's also using like really dated technology um, and that complication is interesting to me but um, yeah thinking about presence do you want to talk about um, you were invited these other performers and you often collaborate with you, I mean you collaborate with other artists but you're actually just inviting them and letting them be themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and how that plays into your work because yeah. I mean I've often come like for example there was a Whitney performance billed solely as your performance and uh, there was a, like a perform a dance piece Right. And I was completely convinced that was, you know, like you had authored that piece or you had choreographed that piece right. when in reality it, it was you inviting two friends or choreographers in. Right, right. Yeah. I, th I think it's, um, I think a lot about context and I think that in some way uh, the way that I'm uh, approaching, I don't know, it's the moment where where like we're all sitting in this room or like we're sharing something when that happens i think the context of of the context is really important like what's being played so i i feel like in some way or what's being performed or how the work is existing and i think like in some way if if i can be a part of that as the work uh then maybe there there's other forms or other ways of of getting to something that isn't just that isn't really mine it's not my authorship it's just like these all of this stuff that I played it really isn't they're not my my tracks it's just really like recontextualizing them um, that's that's like really I think there's something really powerful in, in just that and just the the kind of maybe the framing or um, trying to uh, develop a language uh, in Liu with something so that they can they can have a conversation um, and I think using those performances that happened it was really like well I could I could do something movement based like they were doing but I wouldn't do it the way that they're doing it and I'm interested in that relationship between me and them and I, I'm curious about what would come out of that just by setting that up and uh, it was we didn't we didn't we didn't really I didn't know really what they were gonna do. They showed me like maybe like a minute of what they were gonna do, and so then there it's that was exciting for me to then to then I mean they're dear friends of mine. So then thinking about oh wow like we're we are asking a lot of the same questions, but it's happening in different ways and we're coming from different approaches, different experiences, and I think maybe in that way. 
when the work is presented and people are viewing it or they're coming that in some way hopefully that's happening also uh, that maybe you're thinking about something and that uh, I'm thinking about that too and it can sort of congeal within this moment and then from there it becomes I don't know then it then it go then it continues in some other way um, so I think that it's tricky because the collaboration part isn't necessarily uh, I, don't, I don't really collaborate but yeah like sort of uh, addressing the platform that I can sort of that me and my peers and people that I am interested in can you know I don't know do something in the same context and maybe it's just like just getting everyone there to be able to see us because if we were totally separate doing it maybe you wouldn't have all of these people there at once experiencing that and I think everything uh, when it's in relationship to something else the, qu the questions come up it's like taking a taking like the Charles Ramsey conversation and putting it in relationship to this 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 film that I haven't even seen but the soundtrack is great called Under the Skin you want to, it's like I hear it's an amazing film the the soundtrack the record's really great and then putting that in context with this like this this like testimony or something or this thing is I don't know I'm interested in what that that friction there Question. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Question. Question. <laughs> and please, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, like interrupt or something. I don't know. Or <laughs> uh, you... um, I know a little bit about your sculptural work. Right. And during this audio piece, where you use like two most um, like, like the two most um, dramatic parts of the audio piece was what happened in Ferguson right. and Ohio with the girls who were kidnapped for like 10 years. Right. So for me, you know, being a citizen, he being in the present and knowing what happened, that was so like dramatic to me. And then you use it in your audio piece. So then in your physical work, like how do you just talk about like, how do you bridge those two gaps? Right. Because in the physical work, your sculptural work, you know, those political issues, aren't like present, right? but in the audio pieces, they hit you like a brick, right. you know, your heart is like, whoa. Right, right. So, as artists, Right, like where do they... Yeah, where do they meet? Right, I, th I think, so for me, where they meet is like in this, in this moment, right? And that like, being in the gallery, seeing the work is one specific experience and I think that's something that I've actually, I'm realizing more and more in my practice is that uh, I'm not, I'm definitely not trying to put everything into one, one thing. That it's all, uh, there's a constellation. And that constellation, you, you know, it's like, okay, then what is it, what, what do these, you know, you have this, which is, uh, for one of my audio works that I actually am producing and, making the, the tracks, um, this, this sort of loaded content isn't, isn't as, uh, I don't know, like it's not really there. Like there was, a, there was a piece that I did in Cleveland that I was, it was actually like a commission in the Museum of Contemporary Art there had invited me to do a performance. And they were like, well, you know, we have three options for sites. The first site is the museum elevator. And I was like, that's cool. And then, and then they were like, well, and then there's like the common area. They're like what they call the gun commons. And it's kind of like an atrium-like space. And I wasn't really that interested in that space. And then they said, and then there's this other space that's a pre-Civil War Italianite mansion that's across the street that was a part of the Underground Railroad and it was built in 1853 by abolitionists. And I was like, okay. <laughs> then I, I, think, I think that would be the most appropriate place to try and do something. And so, uh, yeah, the elevator was, was cool. <laughs> and I think in the sort of process of making when these things come up, uh, and I ended up developing a work that 
the house had been condemned for like seven years. And before then, it was a boarding home. And people haven't, they hadn't been in the house. And so it was an opportunity. We could only have 49 people total in the house. And the performance, so what I ended up doing was I made four compositions. There was one that was Civil Twilight that was sunrise. So the performance was at like 6.30 in the morning. And then there was a noon, high noon, high sun, which was like 1.20. And then there was Civil Twilight uh, 2, which was sun down. And then there was a nighttime. And all four compositions related to the time of day. I did like sight, I did field recordings. And that work was really, again, about that sort of presence. But it was also a really charged space and the context was really charged and I think that when the when the opportunity sort of comes in to kind of speak through that then I then I I, I do and uh, but I don't force it it's more like you know there's different levels of intensity and there's different levels of how these things uh, how they sort of I don't know pop up in your mind or the way you think you want one moment you're you're like, you know, you're like, man, I stink, you know, I need to take a shower. And then the next moment you're like watching some crazy video of, you know, this American reporter being beheaded. And you're like, okay, like, how do I, you know, I was thinking about this actually today, uh, earlier, like on YouTube, how like if you're watching videos, that the, the frame is the, is the same, you know, if you don't blow it up, then the frame is always the same. So you could go from like watching a cat video to like that, like to like the Ferguson aftermath in like a click. And, and it's the same sort of framework, it's the same everything. And you can experience those within seconds of each other. But then it's like, okay, well, I mean, that's like a crazy experience. So then what, then what does it mean to like recontextualize some of those things and place them in physical space? Um, and I'm interested in that, but it doesn't, you know, it just doesn't happen all the, it doesn't happen the same way. So I feel like the moments when those, those parts come together or when they, they, start, they start to mesh is actually like now. Like, the, okay, this is it. This is the moment where uh, maybe it doesn't happen solely in the, in, the, in the object. And you could equally say like, where's all the color? You know, there's a lot of color up there. Where's the, it's like, well, maybe it's, it's, it's within us. It's how we are sort of, we're that sort of conduit. Um, yeah. So then you see your sculpture work as being like kind of feeding into like the, the, the performances in a way? Like well, I mean, they, they feed off each other. They like eat, e they like eat each other. You know, it's like a snake There's, that's like, nah, and it's just, you know. I, I think that that's, I think the best way for me to even think about it at this point, I mean, I'm still like trying to, get it uh, is that it's a constellation and that that I mean that's like the best way that I can think about it it's like okay like there's that one and then there's that thing and there's that thing and you're like hmm <laughs> hmm okay and then maybe you and then you get like a dog or something and then you know and then you're like wow that's great you know or th that does something um, but I feel like that's yeah that's like where I mean that's where it is now maybe down the line uh, they'll, it'll it'll be like one like nugget, and then and then I'll stop making art or something. Um, but um, but even in the past, like since I've you know we started this critical dialogues partnership, <laughs> so it's in the past few months. It's you know the the range of um, how you've used uh, your body in performances and your sculpture in performances has changed a lot. So like the very first performance I saw this year was at Casey Kaplan, which was um, similar to this, and that you're on the floor, the lights were a lot darker than they were tonight. Um, and it was very, um, you know, kind of a church-like atmosphere in a way, where we were all just kind of sitting back and absorbing um, and, and just letting the sound carry us. And then the, the next performance after that, you started to uh, use your your body as a medium to to move microphones, and you um, told me that that had a relationship to how you're working with the materials in the studio. Right. 
Right. And so then that kind of like culminated in this last Whitney performance where you're actually embedding the microphones in the sculptures and moving those. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it has like drastically evolved and that's been something that, I mean, it all, it like started, it, you know, like you put like a record on and then you touch the record and you're like, whoa, the sound is really different and you can do this. And then it, it, it my, my body and the way that I was situated, it, it had implications. And so I, it was just by default, I had to like begin to really think about, all right, if I'm gonna perform something, I'm gonna put my, my identity, my everything out there then I have to like really think about what that is and it's I've been increasingly becoming more sensitive and uh, curious about that and thinking about okay so now now I'm more physically involved and the, it's just like it things start just happening in the stu you know it's like I had a studio where I was doing like audio stuff and then I had the sculptures and then like the first microphone or the first thing that gets dirty from like a school, you're like, dang, I just, now I just got to put it in the thing. Or I get, now I have to like, they're really close in proximity and then they, they make more sense in terms of, oh, like this is stemming in the, in the studio in terms of how I'm using my body to make the work. But then if I'm making a performance and this thing is unfolding as in real time, then maybe, maybe there's something that I can do Maybe maybe that's maybe it's it's maybe I do less in the studio and more in in space in with people or in you know within the conversation you know as things kind of like unfold in that way. Um, so yeah, the, now the the sculptures have they I've embedded microphones because I was I was really invested in the physicality of that, but then also I was like questioning a lot of the equipment or things that I was using, like the microphone in particular, like what, you know, like if, if I, you know, do this, then it changes what it, it autom you know, there's, phys there's something physical, there's matter here. And if that matter changes, then this thing changes and th those things change, like everything just changes. So then, okay, well then you, this, then, then what happens when you, there's very deliberate action to change that and then what does that do to maybe like the audio experience and then what people are visually seeing physically and it just all of that has become you know it's kind of like opened up uh there's more to there's just more quite it's like more questions it's like man it's like okay i don't now i don't know less or something <laughs> Um, first, I just wanted to thank you for kind of uh, opening yourself up to us. This was a really cool way to have a talk again, so thank you for that. Um, I've been wrestling the last couple of days with um, the concept of performance and self-expression and what is kind of just expressing myself and being me and what is maybe a little more of a performance, you know, something that I've calculated and I'm trying to do so that um, the outside world sees me as I want to be seen. Right. And I found myself wrestling when you started tonight, like watching everything that you were doing. Right. Um, and then I decided to close my eyes. And it became, for me, a much richer experience. Right. Um, and I said, I'd keep peeking every once in a while to see what you were doing because I'm interested in the technical stuff. Right, right. Um, but I had a very hard time holding those two spaces, watching you move and looking at what you were doing, right. and then feeling like I was really being with the sound. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about that because you're talking a lot about you know like sculpture and sound and there's this sight and sound thing. And right. No, I think that's great because I feel like in some way how, uh, I don't know, even in the performance I did at the Whitney where I was like, you know, it was an audio, it was, it was an audio work, but there's, I'm like walking around, I'm like kind of stalking the space, moving these objects around. There's a lot to sort of watch and see, but even then, uh, I, it's like, I, in, I would encourage, like, you know, close your eyes or experience it in a different way. A lot of people were seated, so then, like, what does it mean to then stand up and kind of walk around in the space because they were, you know, not, 
the audio was kind of moving around the space also, and it changes the experience of that. So I think that the, for me at least, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I can only provide, you know, it's like if I'm going to perform this, there's a certain liveness to this that I would want to do. I want to be able to actually do it here because it's, it's a little more intuitive. It's more uh, about this moment as opposed to like pre-mixing something and then playing it and being like, all right, just listen. Um, but I feel like there's no obligation. And I mean, you always have a choice. And I think that's really important in dealing with audio and then also dealing with the physicality of, of something. Because I think one thing with sound or the way that it travels is you can still feel it. You can still feel, you know, if this if this, the system is right and everything's tuned in the right way, then you can still feel those reverberations, and that's something that I'm I'm also interested in. Um, but I don't. I think that it's it's like yeah, I'm doing this here, but you don't ha you don't have to look at all. And in some way, I think that it's probably better. You know, like we're someone. I think it was Nico earlier was like sitting in the back corner and she was like, well, you can't really see if you're in the back corner. I was like, well, yeah, there's some empty chairs of here. You know, if you want to see, but I don't think that that's, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's necessary. I think that what's necessary is that you approach it in the way that you are engaging or that you feel like uh, you want to engage. And from there, that's, I mean, this is like this meeting halfway. Like if that's the kind of work that you're doing is that kind of wrestling then that's all I could really ask for in the experience of it. How that leads to something else is, is really, I mean, I can't really, I can't determine that experience. Like I couldn't, I wouldn't claim to say, I know what you're going to experience in, in this and you should watch because if you watch, you're going to see that it's like, I don't think, I don't think that's true. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Can you talk about that in relation to um, kind of the, you know, here we, I'm presumably most of the people in the audience came to see this performance <laughs> and it's a closed room and there's kind of a beginning and an end, but then how that, how your approach and your choices change um, because you do so many performances in kind of open museum spaces um, where there is no kind of, I mean, you know, they're, you're attracting passerby who are there for a second or 30 seconds or 10 minutes. And, um, you know, your first performance um, at MoMA made such an impact in, in terms of that. And, and, you know, talking about like your, your expression, your presence, that was like, that was a big statement by, you know, placing yourself at the very center of, you know, the biggest in art institution in the United States. Um, if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's funny because that work in particular, that was the third iteration. The first iteration was in a basement in a room that was, okay, let me see what side. The room was probably from like here over and about this wide, maybe a little bit narrower. And I constructed... Uh, a room inside of that that didn't go up to the ceiling. It was just four walls with like a like a two and a half foot opening, and there was this speaker system on the outside of it. And so the interior of that space was literally small. It was like about the size of this square, but in like a more of a rectangle. And it was very intimate, and it was like just as loud. And people hated me for it because they were like, "This you're, you've created." You just want to say what you were playing. No, oh uh, right, the work for was, people who didn't see. Yeah, it. the work was um, it was a, a mix where I played uh, altered and slowed down acapellas from uh, dead rappers from like the early to mid '90s, and it was just their their vocals. So all of that was kind of processed and slowed down, and really kind of like ghostly and yeah, it was really dark. Um, and it, there, were, there were a lot of frequency changes, so there were a lot of really low-end frequencies and really like high-pitched frequencies, and a lot of reverb and echo. And 
Um, the second iteration of that work was actually at Dance Space at St. Mark's Church. And that was a little more open, but uh, it was still kind of kind of a closed space. And, uh, and then doing it at, at MoMA was like the third iteration. And I think it's still the same work, but each sort of spatial experience was really dependent upon what that space was. And I, I, th I thought that was important, is at least to really just at least consider what the space is and that the volume levels had to be, like we had a rehearsal right before that and there was a board meeting that was happening that night during the rehearsal and they were, they were doing, and the, someone came down and they were like, we were just doing like a sound check and they were like, so, uh, how, you know, we're gonna, the, the meeting is gonna like <laughs> happen in a little bit and uh, so, you know, we'll give you like, maybe like what, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes you could, and I was like, dang, we gotta interrupt it, we gotta stop the rehearsal for like an hour and a half, two hours. So, and so, uh, Ralph Lemon was there and he was like, okay, he's like, that's fine. He's like, that's fine, that's fine. I was like, yeah, I was like, that's all right. And then they went up back upstairs and then I turned it back up and we like started playing it and she came right back down. She was like, actually, we need it off like right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, and then I, and I, and at that moment I was hearing it and I was like, I told Jim Toth, who's the audio uh, like guru, he's like the, the, the guy that was doing that. And I was like, I, um, I need two more speakers actually. Like while they were telling us to shut it down because the, there was a shelf there that dropped off. You, you could hear it in the space where you're sort of, you're walking and you're, you're, you know, you get the low end, you're feeling it, you can hear, you know, the frequencies are very clear. And then as you walk towards like where the contemporary galleries are, it, it, just, it just dropped off. And I was like, we need, you know, another 20 feet out, we need two more speakers here to like finish that, to finish the space. And they were like, are you, are you sure? I was like, I'm, I'm like really sure. And so they did, they went and they got, while we were on, while we were taking the break from the board meeting, we got more speakers, which was, um, which was just, a, it was, it was just appropriate for that space um, because of the level, so. Any other questions? One. Yeah. No. What are you working on now? I know you. Yeah. That's, so, what are you? What's your next thing? What are you doing? Um. So, actually, next week I'm going to Vancouver for. There's a festival called New Forms Festival. It's a contemporary art slash music festival, and I I where I've made my these a sort of body of microphones that will be performed in this kind of like festival context which will be really sort of interesting and um, it's basically the way that that piece operates is that the objects are the microphones but then they're also the speakers so they're they're integrated into one sort of object and uh, and so they they operate as like these little I don't know these like parts and <clears throat> and I the composition that I have sort of there's a rupture that that happens and it and it brings in the house system of the festival which is a more expansive so there's like a there's like a draw from something really sort of close and intimate to this to uh, a like more festival like I guess setting and playing with both of those levels of intimacy um, and space so and um, but you're also inviting the audience to participate for the first time correct I don't know or not yet no, I okay. so. yeah Sorry. I mean I think but I think the way that they'll be situated it, I mean I'm I'm actually like really curious if someone throws a foot out and kicks something um, but we'll see I mean I, I that's kind of the 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 thing that's been in my head this whole time is like 
do I do I have to be in all of the, do I have to have my body in this thing what does it mean to invite someone else to to do something and think about like how they would approach this with their own personal history what would they do um, and then what kind of body what kind of person um, so I've been thinking about that a lot actually um, right I think to like kind of rethink the per like you know like is it can these things exist independently of my personal history do they have do they have to I don't know it's a question that I that I'm asking myself even if it's there in the process of making it then what about the moment where it is sort of like released and someone else kind of takes over yeah it won't happen the, to next week. <laughs> Are there any other questions that anyone has for Lumi or for Kevin? Okay, I think it might be a good time to wrap it up. So thank you all for coming, and thank you, Kevin and Lumi. And um, yeah, clap. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, please join us again uh, on the 25th here in the theater for another artist residence, Bethany Collins, in conversation with Nico Muley. And until then. <laughs> <laughs>